Right, sorry about that. So my name is Robbie. Um, I'm a senior developer at Silverstripe from New Zealand. And while I'd like to say that I was the furthest to travel to get here, I was already in Europe. So I think the guy from Canada wins that hands down. But it's great to be here in this amazing venue in what is, you know, the strongest StripeCon conference uh, in the world. I mean, we've had one in New Zealand last year, which was our first one. Hopefully more to come. And there's been a couple in Australia. Um, but this definitely wins hands down. So a big thank you to, uh, to Lars, to Stacey and Verna and the rest of the StripeCon team for putting this together because it's, it's a pretty amazing place to be. So I'm here today to talk to you about React and how we use it in Silverstripe 4. Um, React is a JavaScript library, for those that aren't, aren't aware, which I'm sure most of you are, for building user interfaces. Um, a quote from the React website, React makes it painless to create interactive UIs, design simple views for each state in your application, and React will efficiently update and render just the right components when your data changes. Declarative views make your code more predictable and easier to debug. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the important parts of the React uh, architecture in the CMS and what they're used for and give some real world examples. So where are we using React already? There's some examples in Silverstripe 4, um, which for those of you that have used Silverstripe 4 already, you'll, you'll be familiar with already. So the big one is the asset admin er uh, area. Um, we have the campaign section. We've got some new features that are going to be shipped soon with uh, upcoming releases of Silverstripe 4, such as the history viewer, uh, the archive section, and then we have a whole lot of little kind of mini components which are being converted into re being React driven, such as tree drop down field uh, and things like that. So some areas of the CMS in this example are completely React driven such as assets and campaigns where the routing kicks off the React render process um, in its entirety essentially, and other parts of it are small components that are kind of injected into an Entwine-based uh, Silverstripe you know, screen like you know, you're used to uh, rendering in Silverstripe 3 and in 2 and older versions. And um, yeah, so the, the other versions of that are small pieces thrown in there. So what do you get in Silverstripe 4? So the Silverstripe admin module, which was broken out of framework uh, in the transition from 3 to 4, provides a lot of the architecture for you to build and create your own React interfaces in your own code, in your own modules, and um, in your project. So these are some of the things that are important when it comes to designing uh, new React components in the CMS, you have the Silverstripe form schema. So one of the things that people love about Silverstripe is the way that it's really easy to declare new form fields and create you know, new forms and have them just automatically kind of spin up. So forms, the Silverstripe form schema is kind of the bridge between still being able to define all your fields in PHP, but have them uh, render easily in React. Um, we have React 15 at this point. We're moving towards um, uh, bringing in React 16, but at the moment React uh, 15 and Redux using, we're using Redux for state management. So React is now powering the bulk of the new user interface, uh, interfaces and features that we're building in the CMS. Um, and it's been a strong focus for us going forwards. We have GraphQL, which is a um, query language which lets you pull out nested data and complex relationships with one query uh, from a back end. And it returns in a JSON format. And we have uh, the Apollo client, which is basically designed to run these queries and easily bind them to your React components and other JavaScript, um, other JavaScript code. We use React Strat, which is basically a bridge between Bootstrap 4 and um, React components, which means that you can use all of the the bootstrap components in your React code without having to worry about you know, rendering all the HTML themselves. And we have built a JavaScript injector for Silverstripe, which is basically the same thing as the PHP injector. Um, and it solves a, a bunch of problems, which I'm going to talk about in a, f a few slides. 
So um, while all that stuff exists in the Silver Stripe core, when you're creating your new features, you still need to define these packages, you know, your React, your React uh, DOM, your, your Redux, your Apollo. You still need to say you want them in your module, but you can use a lot of these components from admin in your own code. So as the CMS grows and heads towards Silver Stripe 5 and 6 and whatever is in the future, um, React is going to be a very important part of that, right? So more and more of the CMS is, is moving to being React driven. Um, we're currently in the process of chipping away and converting all the components in the CMS to being React driven before we make a full shift. Um, some examples of this recently are the, the split mode toggle that you see, which lets you switch between edit and preview mode. Um, in Silverstrike 4.3, that will be powered with um, React and Redux for managing the state. We've built a new history viewer. Um, we're building some inline editing capabilities for content blocks, which will be an important part of the CMS going forwards as well. So, you know, while all these things sound amazing, right, we're used to writing a couple of quick lines of some jQuery end-to-end code or something to modify the way that a form field behaves. Things get a lot more complicated with React and Silverstrike 4, and it, it requires kind of a, a mindset shift because it's sort of a new paradigm in the way that you think of JavaScript development. Um, for example, you don't tell the UI what should update when an event happens, right? Instead, you define components that render in a certain way in a certain context, and then you know you update the context and let them re-render themselves. So it takes you know a bit of time to adjust to the way that this works, but in the end, it makes for more modular, more declarative, more um, decoupled code, I suppose, and it's a lot easier to write unit tests for, that's for sure. So if we have a bit of a look through the new history viewer components, so you know we have the CMS page history controller, which is starting to look a little bit outdated. Um, this is a new plugin replacement, which is available in 4.2 as an opt-in module, and will ship by default in 4.3. This is powered with React and GraphQL. Um, and it lets you list all the versions, compare the versions, see what's changed, and revert back to old versions and stuff like that. So this is maybe a lightweight example, hopefully, of how you can get started and um, write your own React components and UIs, form fields, and you know, start building the stuff into your own code in the CMS. So for the first, the first thing to kick this off, we need to inject a form field, right? So this, at this point, especially with, um, well, actually, with, with both ways that you would implement this, everything's based on a PHP form field in the same way that it was in Silverstripe 3. There's just less uh, reliance on the Silverstripe templating system, I suppose. So the PHP form field provides the JavaScript, the CSS, the requirements that you need to um, run this on the, on the front end. Um, it defines what the React schema component name is, and the form builder loader in React will use this in order to render the right form field when you know, we ask for it on the, in the CMS. Um, the JavaScript injector looks up this component name in React Forms, and at this, this is the point where it will start to apply any transformations and customizations that you have. So the template looks pretty simple at this point. We still need one. Um, particularly for the, the way that Entwine matches a certain selector in the, in the DOM. So this can just be an empty div. In this case, it is. Um, we have a fixed class name on it, which is in the previous slide was like history viewer container or something. And basically, we just say, hey, Entwine, whenever you see this div, we want you to replace it with a React component. Um, so that just yeah, to clarify, this is when you're writing uh, components that are going to be injected into uh, non-React-based areas like the CMS page edit forms at the moment, but you don't need to do this for React-driven areas like Asset Admin, for example. So all the data attributes, rather than defining them in this template, you put them into what we call the PHP form schema. So that will uh, automatically get rendered into a data attribute called data schema um, as a JSON object, and that means that the React components will naturally inherit them straight away, um, but if you're defining your entwine wrapper, then you need to explicitly say, I want the data schema in this component. 
and then they all become available as props on your React component. <coughs> so this is an example of an entwine wrapper for rendering React components. And I know this sounds really weird, but you know, it is what it is for now. So basically what we say is when we find the container, we want to get the context, first of all, because you know, the context is often quite important about where a field is rendered, whether it's in a CMS area, whether it's in a you know, model admin or somewhere else. And then we say, get the data schema, chuck it into the props, and then React DOM render this component to kick the whole thing off. Now, if we need to communicate with other React components in core, uh, you can pull in Redux and share state with that, which is global across the, across the CMS. Now, this is an important thing with the, um, the entwine wrapper around React stuff, is make sure that you unmount your components afterwards. Because what, what happens if you don't do that is that every time you switch between tabs in the CMS, um, it's going to keep stacking up React components, and it's just going to eventually kill the browser. So especially if your components are pretty heavy on you know, queries or API calls or something, that's, you don't want this to happen. So easy, little one-liner to unmount the component after it's um, disappeared from the from the view. Now, yeah, I mean, if you're unmounting a component, it's going to lose its state. Uh, so again, you can store some state in Redux if you need it to be available when it gets remounted again. And from here on in, it's all React. So this is, this is the boilerplate out of the way. Um, and now you can add all the props you want as schema data and just start building your components with React. So here's a very simple example of um, how you render a hello world uh, component in React. And I'm basically just using this as an example to say, yes, all the boilerplate works, right? It's rendering the, the React component, it's available, it's good, and then we can continue on into JavaScript land. So we've created our component. The next thing is to, is to tell the injector that this component exists. So this would exist in a window callback on the, the event called DOM content loaded. And there's plenty of examples of, the, of this in core. You might put this into a file with a whole lot of other definitions of other components that you have in your own code. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is to allow other stuff to extend it or to you know, transform um, these components or the way that they behave. So once this is done, Injector knows about your component and then we can uh, get started with the rendering process. And here we go. So we have a little hello world there. And basically what this says is we're bootstrapped, we're ready to go. And from here on, we can just write React code, which is good fun. So it's a history viewer, right? We need a list of versions. That's kind of the, like the primary goal of, of this component. And we need a list of the versions of the data object so that we can display them. And then eventually, we can compare them and all that sort of stuff. So this is a cut down example of the history viewer component and what it does, it renders a list and it passes in a prop which is versions and we have a method called get versions which basically says all the GraphQL result that we have, trim them up a little bit, do a little bit of formatting and then pass them through to the list component. Um, this is important for pagination because the, the structure of GraphQL results with pagination can have some extra sort of edges and nodes and things like that that we don't necessarily care about in this component, so we just trim them out. So we need to inject the data with a higher order component. And in this particular case with History Viewer, we've built this to be abstract, right? So we don't want to couple in queries saying, give me all the data for the elements, or give me all the data for the pages. We just want to create the architecture, and then we say, if you want to use this for members, and you want to version your members for some reason, you can do that. You can write the query, you can add it to the component, and then you can put the component into your members grid field. You know, if you want to do that, that's your prerogative. So GraphQL will provide this data for us, right? We write the query, we plug it in. The Apollo client will bind our GraphQL query to our components. So we write a little higher, higher order component, um, for those of you that don't know what that is with React, it's basically a function that takes a component and then wraps more stuff onto it and then returns the result. So it's kind of like middleware, I guess, in PHP or in anything. Um, 
So I mean, in, in theory, your component could just return a static list of versions if you wanted to, um, which might be good if you wanted to do the development on the components before you've written the query, maybe. But yeah, so not necessarily coupled to GraphQL, but. Cool, so this is a very lightweight example of how you can easily scaffold GraphQL configuration in the CMS. So what we're saying here is we want to expose the site tree object, which is then naturally going to expose all the child pages and everything else. We want to expose the ID, the last edited field, and the absolute link for it. Um, and we're saying that in this case because that's all we really need for, um, for the history viewer component. Like you can define what you want, right? You can put your own, your own fields in here, you can put title in here, and then the operations which can be done on this. So we have copy to stage, which lets us publish things and revert them from draft and live and vice versa. And we have read. Um, so you get some operations like copy to stage for free. They're built into the versioning module to be compatible with GraphQL, and they'll automatically scaffold themselves onto your queries. Um, and it's important to note as well that for, I'm sure some of you have written some GraphQL scaffolding already. Uh, in Silverstrike 4.3, we separated the schema endpoints into public and private, essentially. So this is part of the admin schema, which means that if you're using GraphQL on the front end, it's not going to be full of all the, all the queries that the CMS needs to run, because you might not want to show that to, your, you know, to anyone who's using your API. Graf graphical, I think is how it's said. Now, this is a wee app which lets you explore your GraphQL schema, write queries, test them out, and see what the results are. So this can be standalone. Um, you can download the graf graphical app and install it on Mac or whatever. Um, or you can download the Silverstripe GraphQL DevTools module, which will install a version that you can run in your browser with the same session and the same context. Um, the difference between the two is really whether you can adjust the request headers, which is important if you're testing authentication, for example. Um, you can explore the schema for your GraphQL API through the, the little docs tab on the right-hand side. So GraphQL is strongly typed, and it's implicitly uh, declarative, right? So the docs are automatically generated, saying here's all your queries, here's all your mutations, here's all your types, and this is how you write a query. It'll auto-complete everything for you. It's really nice. And when the query is ready, then we're ready to put it into a higher order component in JavaScript. So the implementation of doing this is copy and paste that query, add in some variable names, basically, define what the input data for your GraphQL HOC should be, which is a callback. Um, and then you define which props should be bound to the component that this query is on, and which of the, the props that are passed through should continue to be passed through. Uh, and there's an example link there uh, to one of the queries in the CMS, which is for the history viewer component, which can be used for reference. This is where we start to actually apply this, this stuff, right? So this is a, an injector transformation. And what we do here is say, um, on line 14 in this example, uh, line 10, sorry, is an arbitrary uh, alias for you know, our transformation. So it can be whatever you want. Line 14 is a context. Now this, this context is really important. First of all, we're saying the component name, but you might not always want your queries for read pages to be in every history viewer component, right? Like you might be using history viewer in different contexts. So in this case, we're saying in the CMS, uh, in the pages control a CMS content, which is part of the ID of a wrapper in the CMS edit uh, screen, we want to apply a read one page query. But you know it's not going to apply it when you're viewing your version members and model admin. Line 15 in this example is um, the query higher order component. So we've imported that further up in the file, and we're applying it uh, here. And then line 16 is an alias for what the component should be called when it is wrapped with history viewer and your query. Uh, and this shows up when you're inspecting things, and it's quite a good reference point. So you do that, you reload, everything works. Like this is probably not a real world example, right? You're gonna do some debugging and things won't work, but this is a, <laughs> it's a slideshow with screenshots, so it works perfectly. Um, so here's the list. 
you can see, um, you know, I've done a bit of done a bit of UI development, created a couple of little components there. There's one that renders the status, the version state, sorry, and the last edited date. We've got one that shows the author or the person who last published or edited the page. And we've said, cool, this is how it should look. It should be a little table. So make sure you use these two things. Like they're incredibly useful for React development. You've got the Re React and the Redux dev tools and these are browser plugins that you can install. Um, so the React Dev Tools will let you inspect and modify the props of a component. And the Redux Dev Tools will let you inspect the state and see how the state changes over time as the various parts of your code run through the application. You can also you know, switch back to older versions and see how the components re-render themselves through time. There's a little screenshot of the React Dev Tools in action. So it looks a lot like your browser inspector. You can adjust the props on the fly. You can see how React re-renders them. So for example, you could set loading to true and make sure that your little loading indicator shows up. Uh, in this case, I want to see that the versions prop is an array which is correctly filled with all my data from GraphQL, because that's incredibly important to this list showing stuff. And so to summarize, versioned admin, which is the module that the history viewer lives in, provides the architecture, provides all the UI components, it provides the styles, the CSS and stuff like that, and the kind of UI flow of how these components should interact with each other. Um, your module, or the CMS or Elemental as existing examples, will define what the data should be and where it should be displayed in the CMS. And this is done with GraphQL. Um, and we're working to improve this because while it's great to say, here you go, you want to use History Viewer, you need to do you know, a line of config, a, a file of config, a file of GraphQL queries, a file of injector transformations and stuff like that. It's not as easy as it could be, right? So this is our baseline implementation, but we're looking to make it more just plug and play in the future. Um, and part of the reason that that was a blocker for us was that GraphQL queries are inherently static. And that means that, you know, how do we extend that? Um, how, do we, how do we let anybody define their own data types? How do we automatically expose whatever data object they want to use this on to the GraphQL API? Because that's not really how it's supposed to work. So it's a challenge that we're working hard to overcome. So again, yes, this is an opt-in module in Silverstripe 4.2. Uh, and it's going to ship by default with 4.3. So if we talk a little bit about the roadmap of Silverstripe, um, where it's come in the last 12 months, where it's going to be heading. Silverstripe 4.0 was officially released as stable almost a year ago in November 2017. And there's been a lot of development work going on since then. So these are some high level things that we've achieved since 4.0 became stable. I'm going to go into a bit more detail with these shortly. There's been a major focus on new content editing UIs and uh, CMS flow, and we're putting a lot of emphasis on content blocks and modular kind of content structures because we think that that is the way that content editing is going to be is going to be done in the future. We've got better and more versioning, more options, better APIs and versioning. Um, an example. Uh, is the React History Viewer. Another example is an archive section where you can look at the things that you've deleted, which previously wasn't available. Um, we're focusing on making the JavaScript ecosystem more flexible. So one of the things that pe people love about Silverstripe is how flexible it is, right? You can chuck an extension onto a PHP class and you can modify most of it. You know, And if you can't, then you overload it with Injector and you change whatever you want. Um, we need to have that same kind of flexibility with the JavaScript side. Uh, and that's tricky because JavaScript is, well, this JavaScript is pre-compiled, so we need it to be extensible, even though you've already compiled everything or we've compiled everything and given it to you. So we're doing this with things like the JavaScript injector, which is now going to let you do things at runtime, um, and GraphQL scaffolding and fragments, and we'll come back to this in a minute. We've unified the search interfaces. So the UX team at Silverstripe found that there was like five or six different search interfaces in the CMS. 
So we did some work, combined them into kind of one common interface, and then implemented it everywhere. So you'll find that in the CMS uh, list search area. You'll find it in grid field search. You'll find it anywhere, hopefully, where there's a search. And there's been a lot of other changes as well. So 4.1 introduced the public web route, which lets you separate your you know, public serving files from the stuff that you don't want anyone to ever access, basically. We've, um, there's a lot of work that's gone into better HTTP caching in Silverstrike 4.2. And there's been a massive focus on user experience in the CMS. So we have a team at Silverstripe of three or four people which are basically um, trying to improve the way that the CMS works, how easy it is to use, make sure that everything's accessible, all that kind of thing. And the, part of this includes creating a design system management. It's basically an online style guide where you can go and find all the future and current designs for what the CMS is going to look like. And we have a React equivalent, basically, where uh, the pattern library, which shows you all the React components we have, how to use them, what the variations of the props look like, all that sort of stuff. So content blocks, right? Modular content editing in the CMS. This can be really important for certain kinds of applications, like if you want to pull out your content in a structured way, maybe you have a lot of content on your page, you want to lazy load it, you don't want to render it straight away, you know, modular content editing, we think, is the future of the CMS. We have in-flight work at the moment, which is converting what you, uh, what you use with the Silverstripe Elemental module uh, into a React and GraphQL-based component. And this is, as I said before, paving the way for a fully React-driven CMS edit, um, editing area. Now, these designs are showing in the bottom right. We've, we've got a list of components there, different types of elements. We've got a little add, add new screen. And what we're also seeing at the bottom is a future piece of work with layout blocks where we're letting CMS users define the way that something will be rendered, right? Like, it should be two columns wide. It should be five columns wide. We want this to be on the right. This one should be on the left. These should be in a row, things like that. So that's upcoming work as well. Next, the history viewer. So this is a screenshot um, of the compare mode part of history viewer, which is coming with 4.3. So this lets you compare the two versions of, um, of a data object or a page or an element or whatever. Um, you can see what the, what's changed. You can revert back to older versions using GraphQL mutations. Um, yeah, and all the, the state of here is stored in Redux. The global archive area. So you've deleted a page at some point. Maybe you did it by accident and didn't realize. And then eventually you're like, where did that go? Well, we have now got an area, right, where you can go and find it. Um, the three kind of data object types that we figured were going to be the most commonly used, files, blocks, and pages. They've got their own tab at the top right. Everything else is going to go into the Others tab and a little drop down by data object type. And you can kind of filter through a list. You can you know, find out what it was. You can restore it, stuff like that. And React and GraphQL extensibility. As I said before, you know, these, these things are typically pre-compiled, which makes it really tricky to modify them. Um, and it doesn't match up with the typical developer experience for Silverstripe development, which is I should be able to easily extend um, you know, whatever I want, basically, right? So we're trying to make this easier and more accessible. And this is where Injector comes in. Injector lets you say, that component, I want to apply my transformation to it, but only in one context. Um, or I want to completely replace it. To be fair, you can do that as well. Injectable GraphQL fragments which are parts of a GraphQL query that you can register with Injector, and you can modify them, change them, and these are all applied at, at runtime when you actually you know, execute this in your browser. So this is introducing an extensibility angle into GraphQL queries, which are statically, uh, which are pre-compiled. So this is giving us more flexibility in that area. We're focusing a lot on this at the moment. Um, an, an exciting piece of work that's going to showcase this coming up is the React grid field which has had a huge amount of research and a huge amount of dev time, and it's, it's in progress with a few options at the moment. It's likely going to ship as a new module alongside core release, but not necessarily becoming the default uh, until Silverstripe 5. 
the unified search interface. So as I said before, there's four or five, maybe six different kinds of search UIs. Hopefully now we only have one. Um, there's more flexibility in this interface. There's more control over search filters. Um, you can, you know, be as granular as you want, and the best of all, this is powered with React. We've also been focusing on streamlining the definitions of our release management processes. Um, so Silverstripe 3 is supported de until December 2020. It's now in limited support, which means critical bug fixes, security fixes, and important issues introduced by new browsers. So that basically means no new features for Silverstripe 3. Uh, Silverstripe 4, lots of new features, great upgrade tools. You know, the upgrader tool, hopefully, that, p that you've used to upgrade your own code has matured a lot in the last couple of months. Um, the documentation's been constantly worked on, public web route, versioning, archiving all the things, better HTTP caching, um, and draft defaults. The design system and the pattern library, we're really working to build that out to help people like you be able to see what, uh, what you can use with the React architecture and the design systems as well. And we're focusing on pushing more features into Silverstrike 4 minor releases rather than waiting for them for Silverstrike 5. We're saying this might be breaking, so we're going to release it as a new module, and you can opt into using it if you want to rather than replacing it and you having to wait for years and years to actually use it. Um, and this is going to prolong the lifespan of Silverstrike 4. So we have two years of limited support after Silverstrike 5 gets released. Um, for Silverstripe 4. So there's plenty of time in Silverstripe 4's support timeline here. And the new, um, we have more clarity on release expectations. Now basically what this means is minor releases, we're going to give six months notice for the end of life of a minor release. And then after that it'll go into limited support. Uh, and more regular patch releases. So we're expecting at least once a month that you should get a new patch release out. And here's a wee graphic of the uh, amended timeline from Ingo's blog post last week about the expectations around Silverstrike 5. And what's coming up in 2019? We're going to be putting a big spotlight on GraphQL outside of the CMS. It's like we, we're using it a lot now in, in the CMS, and we see that there's a lot of potential for this to basically make Silverstripe a flexible and powerful content API for anything, right? Like mobile apps, you know, I don't know, parking meters, whatever you want. So we're really focusing on this. Headless websites, apps, integrations, external systems. We want to make a unified content API. We want to implement complex searching in the GraphQL API. Really open this up to be completely driven with the API for any kind of application, including the Silverstripe CMS, of course. We're going to focus on what Silverstripe is really good at, which is you know, easily scaffolding new data types, easily managing content in complex situations, versioning, relationships, all these kinds of things. Like This is what Silverstripe is good at, so we're going to really push this. Uh, and we're going to work on being able to integrate with other tools like Google Analytics and targeting engines like VWO or Optimizely for A-B testing. Rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, we want to integrate more directly with these third-party tools. If we have a look, a little bit uh, of a look at the technology roadmap going over the next couple of years, we're going to be working to help teams realize the benefits of using GraphQL. So this really means making everything easier, making the benefits of it known, and working towards a general purpose content API that can be used for anything. We're going to be responding to the market needs around APIs in general, both software and infrastructural. Um, there might be new components required. There might be documentation around setting up API gateway on AWS, for example, to work as the authentication layer between your GraphQL API and the consumer, for example. Authenticated APIs are a big part of digital experiences, including identity management systems. So not just a Silverstripe login anymore, perhaps. We have single sign-on. We have third-party login providers. You know, We have some upcoming work 
in the next few quarters around looking at adding official support for multi-factor authentication, um, which will be really good as well. And we're focusing on clarifying the Silverstripe 5 timelines as well. We have an average at the moment of about 25 active contributors per month. And they, these make up 500 commits a month roughly. And I'm sure that a lot of you in the room are involved in that number. So a massive thanks to everyone for being involved and in contributing your time and your effort into making Silverstripe what it is. Across, across all of the time that these repositories have been on GitHub, which is 11 years, we've had 64,000 commits, excluding the supported, some of the supported modules. And this has come from 600 individual contributors. They've modified 800,000 lines of code. Um, and on GitHub at the moment, we have about 880 open issues and 4,500 closed. There's about 70 pull requests that are open and there's about 10,000 that are closed. So I think relatively speaking, it's, it's a very, very rapidly evolving kind of project and it's, it's very active. If you wanna get started with contributing, you can go into GitHub, you can start to filter uh, the list of open issues by a label like effects Silverstripe 3 or this effort is gonna be easy, which means that I should be able to do it quickly or without a lot of knowledge about the inner workings of the CMS. A lot of these are often CSS bugs or documentation issues or something like that. We have a contributing guide which outlines the processes that we like people to follow, which could be branching names or um, putting commit prefixes on or how you format your code or you know, writing unit tests for everything that you change or you know, things like that. And that's available on the documentation website. And we have the design system manager, which is the living style guide for the designs, the UIs, and all the components basically that are in the CMS. So it's always good to refer back to these kinds of things. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be in um, the beautiful town of Enskede and to talk to you today. Um, and there's time for some questions, I think, if anyone has any. So uh, thank you, Robbie, for your talk. Um, anyone has questions? to Robbie about React or anything else? Okay. Hi. <clears throat> um, I'm just curious, is there currently any, uh, for, or what kind of uh, authentication security model is there possible at the moment uh, around GraphQL queries? So at the moment we have um, two authentication methods. One of them is the CMS session, so you can be logged in and use it while you're in the CMS. The other one is basic authentication. Um, there's been some third-party modules already that have been published by um, Simon Erklins, for example, who's done uh, like a JSON web token uh, module, I think, for GraphQL. Okay. Um, and we've been looking at ways of integrating OAuth kind of providers and stuff like that, but we haven't completed them yet. And is it like, so it's, it's Either you have access or you don't at the moment, right? So it's not possible to have like can view, can... Uh... Right, yeah, so all the permission levels are built into, at least the built, built into the default scaffolding. So the can view, can edit, can publish, all that sort of stuff is internally checked with the member okay. that you're logged in as. So that, that sort of doesn't change? No, it doesn't change. Okay. Um, unless you're writing your own scaffolders, in which case yeah. you have to explicitly check for them. Great, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Any other questions around? Yep. Thank you. Um, so uh, how does the Redux state look like? What does it look like? How much data is being stored there? For example, the form field components uh, in the site tree page edit uh, section? Do they have their internal state or do they store the value in Redux? So um, I think the question was, 
do the form fields and the CMS edit screen manage their own state or whether it's stored in Redux? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that depends on each one. Um, usually we've been trying to push as much into the Redux state as possible because that means that other things can use it. Um, but there are some cases where there's internal state and there are situations where we've decided there's no reason that this should be exposed to anyone else. All right, thank you. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. I love this job, so I can move around. Uh, first of all, thank you for your insights. And, uh, how are you? Or is there any like storybook where you can see all the uh, React components and how they're working and inspecting them? The DSM is only in Vision, isn't it? Uh, you're asking if there's a way that you can see where all the React components are and how they look? Yes, and yeah, how to contribute so to only the components. Is there a right. repository only for them? Um, so that most of them live in the Silverstripe admin repository. Um, and as we build out this ecosystem, we're going to be pushing more of them into other modules as well. But all the base ones are there. So your text field, your tiny MCE editor, your drop down field, they're all in the admin module. Um, and in terms of looking at what they look like, you can load up the React pattern library, which is also in Silverstripe admin, um, and then see this is what all the form fields look like and this is how you use them. Okay, thanks. Would be really great to have them in on NPM packages, like that we yeah. can use them on the front end too. Yeah, so there is one, and it is published already at the moment with the admin module. Okay. Um, but we are looking at uh, publishing it somewhere like a, you know, a Heroku bucket or something where you can just look at it at any point and say, here's my patent library. Thanks. So um, thank you, Robbie. Great. Thank you very for much. Talk.